Happy Sabbath, everyone. And uh, it's good to be home, as I mentioned during Sabbath school. It's still true. It was an hour ago, and I'm still glad to be home. <laughs> Today's message, dealing with the challenge of self-denial, is really striking to the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. And uh, when I talk about this issue, it, it's uh, really personal because I'm talking to myself. Um, I'm always assuming that I'm not alone, that some of you are like me in that your biggest struggle is with our very natural tendency to be selfish. Uh, sin is a three-letter word. And in the very middle of the word sin is the letter I. Have you heard the expression before, with them? With them. You don't want to think with them. With them is an acronym that stands for what's in it for me. You'd be surprised how often through the day you say what you say and do what you do and go where you go and eat what you eat, all because you're asking what's in it for me. It, it seems to be the, the governing motive in the carnal heart. And unless we resist it, we'll find, or the Holy Spirit uh, saturates us, we find that we all start thinking with them. And uh, who was it, Augustine, that said, uh, Lord, save me from sin, but not yet. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Problem we have with sin is we enjoy it. That we're naturally selfish. But Jesus, in that verse that we read there in Luke, he said that the, the guiding principle in Christianity, if anyone, that would be you, man, woman, young and old, if anyone desires to come after him, that's what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, let him deny himself, take up his cross, that's death, and follow me. By the way, it says, deny himself daily and take up his, that word daily is in the Luke version, it's not in the other, it's a daily. And follow me, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Self-denial. It's not easy. Even among Christians, there was a survey done a couple of years ago, they asked a thousand Christians, why does the church exist? 89% responded, the church exists to take care of my and my family's spiritual needs. Only 11% said, the purpose of the church is to win the world to Jesus Christ. We will find out next Friday where this church fits into that scenario. <laughs> We're gonna be trying to do some evangelism and reach our area for Jesus. And um, I hope you'll become involved as much as possible in helping with that series. So what is self-denial? Self-denial, by definition, and this is both some biblical and dictionary definitions kind of commingled. Self-denial is a restraint or limitation of one's own desires or interests. The willingness to deny one's possessions, positions, or pleasures in order to grow in holiness and commitment to God. Now the Greek word, which I can't pronounce, that's used there in, in Luke for deny, it means to renounce a person fully in all respects, perseveringly. It's an ongoing renouncing of self-interest. It's a compounded word. I'm reading from Matthew Henry's commentary, I'm sorry, Adam Clark's commentary here. It's a compounded word and abundantly increases the meaning. Combination of words, it means a follower of Christ will need to observe it in its utmost latitude, an ongoing renouncing of self in order to be happy there, happy here, and in the glorious hereafter, a man's self is to him the prime cause of most of his miseries. Selfishness is the prime cause of most of our miseries. I know that's true with me. I don't know if it's true with you, but the way I hear some pastors and some churches advertising Christianity, you would think that Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he will have lots of money. 
Jesus didn't say that. But I've heard pastors all but say that. Jesus did not say, if anyone desires to come after me, he will be loved by everybody. Matter of fact, he said, uh, woe unto you if all men speak well of you, for so they did of the false prophets. Jesus did not say, if anyone comes after me, they will experience unlimited satisfaction of all their carnal desires. You'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. He didn't say that. He said, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross. Jesus took his cross to his crucifixion. And uh, it doesn't come easy. But that's the only way to have eternal life. You know, there's a story in the Bible. You find it not in John or Mark, but you do in Matthew and Luke. In Matthew 27, 32, after Christ had been tried, he'd been beaten, he'd been mistreated by Herod's soldiers, he'd been brought before Pilate, he'd been whipped, trying to satisfy them rather than kill Jesus. Pilate said, well, look, I'll scourge him and let him go. He scourged him, but he didn't let him go. And then they put a cross on his back, and he had not gone far from the palace of the Antonian fortress when Jesus fell under the burden. And it says in Matthew 27, 32, now as they came out, presumably came out from where he had been whipped, they placed the cross on him, and he fell. And they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear his cross. Luke 23, 26, same story. And as they led him away, they laid hold on one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. On the way to the crucifixion, have you ever thought what a privilege to be able to bear the cross of Jesus? Have you ever thought, if I lived back then and I saw Jesus fall under the burden of his cross, what an honor if I could be the one to say, here, Lord, let me help you and I'll carry your cross. Amen. Well, you've got that privilege right now. That's right. Uh, and it's actually in some ways harder than just picking up a piece of timber and huffing and puffing and lugging it up a brief hill. In denying self, you are being invited to share in bearing a cross. That's not easy. Not when you get down to the nitty gritty of what it means to deny self. Amen. We're gonna talk about what some of those things are. Well, I could have started anywhere, but for whatever reason, I decided with denial of possessions. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if you'd be perfect, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now, some will be quick to remind me that Jesus isn't asking everybody to be an apostle and do that, and that's true. The Lord is not asking us right now, as we leave church, to shed ourselves of our wallets and anything we've got, to go home and liquidate our bank accounts and to donate it all to the church. He was asking that man, really, to do that. He was asking him to close out his accounts, to sell his home, to give it to the poor. Jesus didn't say give it to my ministry. You notice that? It's the way some evangelists preach that message. It's liquidate and give it to me. Jesus didn't say that. He said give it to the poor. He said then you follow me. Matter of fact, you'll not find anywhere Jesus said give your money to me. Some did, but he, you never hear him say that. It's hard to believe that the way you hear some evangelists preach. But Jesus really does ask all of us to do what he asked that young ruler to do, in that when you come to Christ, you put it on the altar. You say, it's not mine anymore, it's yours. All that I have belongs to you. There's some other verses. You can read where Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke 5, 11, when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. That's what it means to be a disciple. Luke 14, 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now that's clear. He's not just talking about the call to the apostles. Let me read that for you again. Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has 
cannot be my disciple. Well, that's kind of tough, Pastor Doug. How do you know whether you've done that or not? Well, I would think that it means that whenever the Spirit lays on your heart that there's some need that you say, Lord, I am simply a steward of your resources now. What do you want me to do with your resources? So that you've already given it to the Lord and you're just allocating as He directs. Matthew 19, 29, and everyone who has left, oh, actually, I want to read Matthew 19, 27 first. Peter said, Lord, we left everything and followed you. What will we have? And Matthew 19, Jesus answers in verse 29, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, notice how much they had to leave for Jesus. Houses and lands, father and mothers, children, for my sake, will receive a hundredfold more and inherit eternal life Amen. in the world to come. Amen. Hebrews 11, speaking of Moses, verse 24, by faith Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach, reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked for the reward. Moses was looking for a reward beyond. Now, was it the reward of the city of God, the reward? Well, yeah, but more than that, Moses was looking for the reward of Christ. Because if you think about it, if you say, I am willing to forsake everything here so that I can get more, it's not really hard to move out of your house if you're moving into a mansion. Is that self-sacrifice? So if the idea of sacrificing all that you have means that you're getting more tangibly, it's not a self-sacrifice, it's a transaction. Right. You got that? But when you're saying, I'm willing to give it all, expecting nothing in return for Christ, that's self-sacrifice. So much of what I hear being preached as self-sacrifice is really talking about trading. And in a sense, it is a trade. But Jesus said, real self-sacrifice is losing everything that you might have everything that God wants. But you're losing it for Christ and for others. Did that make sense? Uh, you know, the way I hear it preached sometimes, it's, it's really, what's in it for me? Whiff them. It's just Christian form of whiffing. I'll give up this, but what do I get? Well, that's not self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice, Jesus says, give, expecting nothing in return. He says, even the pagans give, expecting to be recompensed. Even the pagans invite friends over, saying, now it's your turn next to invite me over. And I go out to lunch every now and then with a buddy, and I'll say, here, let me pay. And the next time he says, I'll pay. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? What's in it for me? I'll pay this time so I can feel good this time, and you can feel good next time. This time, we'll go somewhere cheap. Next time, somewhere expensive. <laughs> because you're paying. Self-denial means the denial of your rights for your possessions. And you know, I, I struggle with that. Again, I'm just being honest, and I don't claim to have all the answers. Uh, I, I fall back on what Wesley said, that being a Christian means that you earn all you can, you save all you can, and you give all you can. And as Karen and I, in our quiet moments, ponder estate planning and what you want to do for the kids and what you want to do for God's work, and it should not be in that order. First thing you should think of when you, if you have any estate, what do I want to do for God's work for eternity? Because that's storing your treasure in heaven. I, you wonder, how do you divide that ratio? And so you say, Lord, everything I have belongs to you. How do you want me to do this? And how much should I save now since the world's ending? I mean, you think about retirement. Do you ever think about it? I never, when I was young, I thought retirement, you know, when I joined Amazing Facts at first, I didn't even claim Social Security. So, oh, well, the Lord's going to come and there'll be no Social Security left because, you know, it's all going to run out of money. And a few years went by and I thought, I might actually have to retire. <laughs> I might actually live long enough to retire and I'll need something to live on. So I started setting aside the Social Security. And so you wonder, how much do I save for old age? Well, Lord, when are you coming? Can you let me know so I could just, you know, I want to have enough to get to 70, but I don't need to live till 90 because you'll come by then. Am I the only one that thinks these things? 
Well, you give it all to Him. And, uh, and you just pray for wisdom in the decisions that you make, and He'll give you peace. And pray for the bachelors, because we still try to sort this stuff out every day, you know? How do you pace yourself so that your possessions all belong to the Lord? Self-denial in your relationships. Now, this gets tough. Again, I didn't put these in any particular order. Jesus said, whoever loves father or mother is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You notice he connects the denial and the relationships with the cross again. Every now and then I'll meet a young woman or a young man. They're believers and they've taken a fancy to somebody that might be a wonderful person, a beautiful person, a healthy person, an ethical person, but they're not a believer. And they say, oh, you know, where am I going to find someone that is, so, this, this is really, you know, prime material. I found this person, just a wonderful person, this is little detail. They don't believe quite like I do. But we get along so well. They got a wonderful family. They're educated, good looking. And Jesus said, you need to deny yourself in your relationships because his word is very clear. You should not be unequally yoked together. And that means you put the Lord first and you take the cross of having to write them a letter and say, you know, I really care about you, but God comes first. And if God is not first in your life, we don't have a future together. And that can be tough. But that's what it means to deny yourself. And I've seen Christian young men and women cry their eyes out because they knew they had to tell somebody this is not going to work. In every other way, it looks like it might work. And it was a test because later God brought them someone better that did believe. But they had to deny themselves. It's tough. You know, you can see in the Bible, some people were even asked to put away husbands and wives. Let me read this to you. And you might think, well, Pastor Doug, is this an endorsement for a divorce? Well, there are times. Ezra 10, verse 11. Now, therefore, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. Separate yourself from the peoples of the land and the pagan wives. Now, Abraham had to put away Hagar because he had one wife too many. So that would be grounds for divorce. One of them. And she was the pagan. And he stayed with his first wife, who was the worshiper of Jehovah. But can you imagine how difficult that was? I read that story, and you find it both in Ezra and Nehemiah, where they had come back from Babylon. They'd been carried off by their sins, and they came back, and they began to intermarry with all the pagans. And God said, this is why you were carried off to Babylon. You're doing the same thing. This, oh, well, wait, it's too late now. We got kids and stuff. He said, no, no, no. We're getting ready to rebuild the temple. We're not going back down this road again. It's not too late to annul these things. Stop it. And they had to make some tough decisions. Now, don't use that as an endorsement for an unbiblical divorce. I'm just reading a verse to you where they had to put the Lord first, and it must have been very painful. Self-denial in diet. Now, this is something that is an ongoing struggle. But I was surprised how much the Bible had to say about that. I know the health educators in our midst are going to appreciate this section. <laughs> Daniel 1, verse 8. Daniel resolved he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank, though it may have tasted good. I added that part. <laughs> he knew that it was inappropriate to eat the unclean things that the pagans were eating and the alcoholic beverages that came from the Babylonian cafeteria, even though it risked his security, he had to deny himself. And while everyone else was eating it up, feasting, Daniel and his friends were eating vegetable mush. Now, he ended up being healthier because of that. And it was better for him. But he had to deny himself. You can read later, Daniel 10, verse 3, during a time when he was fasting, I ate no delicacies, no pleasant food, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for three full weeks. He was fasting. Now, why do Christians fast? And you know, when I say that, it, to be very frank, that just sailed over most of your heads, and you're going to let it go. 
because you think fasting, oh, that's some Old Testament ritual that they went through or some biblical, is that, that's an ancient custom. But you know, the Bible says, Jesus didn't say, if you fast, Jesus said, when you fast. Fasting and praying is part of, the, I don't want you to be like the publican that will stand in the front of the church and say, Lord, I thank thee that I fast twice a week. But there are times when you need to fast and pray. There are health benefits in fasting. Amen. But there are spiritual times. You might know somebody that's afflicted by the enemy. And there's a father that brought his son to Jesus and, and he said, Lord, why couldn't your disciples do anything? And Jesus said, this kind does not come forth except by prayer and fasting. And I know a father came to me once, he said, we've been praying for our son. And I said, have you ever fasted and prayed? Well, no. Sometimes you might want to fast and pray about our meetings that begin this week. There are special causes. When the people of God were going to be annihilated in the book of Esther, she asked everybody to fast and pray for three days. That's pretty serious. Daniel went three weeks. Now, he didn't say he needed anything. He was an old man at that point, and he'd probably fall over from low blood sugar if he hadn't eaten anything. You got to, you know, be intelligent about it. And you all know your bodies. And, you know... <laughs> I heard this rabbi was talking to his wife and he said, you know, I got into a discussion with a priest and the priest said, yeah, for Lent we give up food for 40 days. And the rabbi said, well, for Yom Kippur we give up certain things for a day. And the rabbi's wife laughed. She said, the Gentiles even pay retail when it comes to their feasts. <laughs> They're giving it up for 40 days, but we get a bargain wholesale, Yom Kippur one day. And Protestants, we have a theology where 365 days, we don't have to give up anything. That's not like just saying, you know, I'm gonna do without chocolate for a day. Fasting, there's reason. And do we have reasons to fast? The world's coming to an end. What reason do you want? Uh, there's, there's reasons to fast and pray. We might be like Christ. I'm not done. Proverbs 23, 20. Be not among drunkards, do not be among gluttonous eaters. Proverbs 25, 16. If you found honey, eat enough, lest you fill yourself and vomit it out. If it's a, a pleasant thing, just eat a little bit. We shouldn't be living on junk food. Amen. Romans 14, 21. It is good not to eat food, food or wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. So there's another principle. Deny yourself even something you think you might have a right to eat if it's going to cause a problem for someone else. Now, that's, uh, that was particularly written in the case. You had a brother that was afraid to eat food that had been offered to an idol, and it, it made him uncomfortable. And even though Paul said, look, I have no problem buying food in the market that may have been offered to an idol. It doesn't bother me. The idol is nothing. But if my brother is concerned about it, I'm not going to eat it, even though I may have a right to eat it, even though it's clean food, because it might cause him to stumble. He, that's called self-denial. I am not going to do something because it might offend someone else, even though it inconveniences me, or I'll have to sacrifice some pleasure because I love my brother. Now, that principle regarding diet goes through a lot of things in life. You don't want to do anything that's going to make a brother or sister stumble. Amen. Anything, by your example, you want to be... We were out of town for a uh, couple of weeks during this last series, and our, one of our neighbors, uh, a, a dear believer, goes to Central Church, next door neighbor, took care of our flowers and our mail for us while we were gone. And so I thought I'd like to do something nice for the family, and I, I told Karen, I said, we got anything, you know, we just got back, she hadn't gone to the market, I said, well, let's bring him something. I went in the closet, and I had one of those bottles of Martinelli, uh, you know, so you get apple and, yeah, yeah, but it had something else, and it was cherry, too. It was good, good stuff, good stuff. But it's in, you know, the wine bottle. And it's middle of the day, and I want to take it next door. And I thought, everyone in the neighborhood knows I'm a pastor. I thought, am I going to walk down the street and hope nobody's looking out their window as Pastor Doug's walking down the street with his bottle in his hands? <laughs> Looks very much like a wine bottle. You all know what I'm talking about. So I put it inside an amazing fax bag. 
Now I know that it was apple juice, bubbly apple juice, just apple juice. And my neighbor would have known, but I didn't want to make anybody stumble. <laughs> and so I thought, I'm putting it, I thought if I just had it in a brown bag where it was sticking up out of the top, that would have looked really bad. So I put it where it was completely covered inside an amazing facts bag and took it next door and they appreciated that. And I told them that too. I said, you know, I brought it over in a bag because, I, you know, I don't want the neighbors to be. They understood. So you don't want to do anything to make your brother stumble. In connection with the denial in appetite, it's just the general denial of sensual carnal pleasures. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, and there's the key, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Right. Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now, it doesn't mean that you're never to enjoy your food. This is a great sermon just for potluck. Like everyone feels guilty and you're afraid to enjoy your food, right? It's not saying that. It's just saying you can't be controlled by that. It's, you know, the Bible talks about eating for strength and not for drunkenness. 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. And of course that goes a lot further than appetite. There's sexual passions. There are all kinds of carnal passions you could decide there, which wage war against your soul. You've got a spiritual side and you've got a physical side and there's sort of there's an, an antithesis between the two. Enmity. Matthew 5, 29, Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, pluck it out, and throw it from you. Better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And I think it's interesting if you jump to Matthew 18, 8, he says the same thing, but he adds in your foot and your hand. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands and two feet be thrown into eternal fire. You see with your eye, it's your direction, it's your vision for your life. You touch with your hand and you go with your foot. It's talking about the direction of your life, the sensitivity of your life, what you're grasping, your possessions, your vision. All of these things need to be consecrated by the cross. You, we need to learn self-denial in all of these areas. Does that make sense? Now, I don't want you to misunderstand, what is it, the Nike slogan? What's the Nike slogan? Just do it. See, you know it, just do it. And some people think the Christian slogan is just don't do it. And I'm not saying just don't do it. But there are times when you need to live by that slogan, just don't do it. And you know, for parents, teach your children self-denial. They've got to learn that. Don't say, because I love them, I want to satisfy every woman desire. You're going to hurt them. Right. You must teach them self-control, self-denial, discipline, a lot of things that you think, oh, the poor baby, it's actually good for them. And the mother sometimes said, oh, but he's crying. And the father will say, let him cry, he'll live. That's why God puts men and women together, right? <laughs> now, I won't tell you who. I won't tell you who. <laughs> but I know parents... Their kids cry and they get in bed with them and they're like nine years old. Come on now. Oh, but they're crying. And they may cry for an hour. They may cry for two, but at some point you're going to have to listen to them cry and they will go to sleep. Eventually they will go to sleep. I know people, you go visit them and shh, kids are sleeping. You got to tiptoe around the house. They got to learn to sleep while you're living. Right? If they're really tired, they'll go back to sleep. If they're not tired, they'll wake up. And it's like, now the reason I say that is we're living in a society where the, the, the rigors of growing up on a farm, most people don't, there are so many conveniences in our world today. There's so many areas where we have just every little satisfaction at our fingertips that children are growing up in a world well, they don't understand work. They don't understand a healthy amount of pain, discomfort, self-denial, self-control, discipline. 
and it is really hard to learn. You can learn it, but it's much harder to learn when you're grown up. The concrete starts to set and it's difficult. And they think the whole world exists to satisfy their every desire. And the slightest inconvenience, they start to moan and complain and whine. And I'm still trying, the reason I'm telling you this is because I, I was spoiled as a kid. I mean, compared to a lot of kids in the world, I actually told my mother when I was 11 years old, I saw what was happening and I said, I need to go to military school to learn some discipline. That was actually something perceptive, I said. And it really did help me because they didn't care. They, they, they were tough and I, you needed to learn that. And Karen will testify, I'm still, I need an order. I'm, she thinks I'm eccentric. But I mean, because you learn those things, they beat it into you. And that's not all bad. But it's hard to learn later in life to deny yourself. And if every time you cry, your parents give you what you want, what's gonna happen when we reach a day where you can't buy or sell food unless you deny your faith? If you're used to having, I told Karen, she said, what time do you wanna eat last night? I said, 5.30. It was 6.30 and I was really hungry because I just ate breakfast, so I hadn't eaten any dinner. But she had eaten lunch and I hadn't, so she wasn't hungry. I thought I was gonna die by 6.30. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, Lord, when the day comes, and you can't, 5.45. It was later than that, but we won't go there. Usually we make tacos, but I got so hungry, I said, go to Chinese, get something. <laughs> anyway, it was good, but we're okay. We're, you pray for us. But, um, and you're thinking about, is there gonna come a day when we can't buy or sell? Amen. Is there a chance you might get hungry? Absolutely. If we can't fast for an hour without thinking our world is falling in, and we have to sign on the line and forfeit our faith, unless you learn to deny yourself and control those passions and urges and desires, then how will we stand? We somehow think, well, because I know what the Bible says about prophecy in the last days, that I am gonna have this supernatural ability to deny myself, even though I've never practiced it in my real life up until that point, suddenly I'm gonna be injected with this power. I don't think so, friends. I think now we have an opportunity to learn to deny ourselves that will prepare us for what's coming. And if we're not learning it now, we will not have it then. It's like laying in a hospital bed without getting up for six weeks and then thinking you're gonna get up and run around the track. You'll faint. You just will not be able to do it. Now in the little tests that come to us, we need to be practicing self-control, denial, self-discipline. We need to learn those things in prestige and position. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. If we are constantly thinking about wanting the prestige and the power and the position and wanting to climb and wanting the respect, that's not the mind of Christ. Jesus was willing to serve. He was willing to take the lowest position. I heard about the Secretary of State in Illinois, Paul Powell, years ago, when they began to have these uh, personalized license plates. He had to decide who was gonna get the license plate that said, number one. And he thought, man, I'm gonna make everybody mad because I had several applications for number one. He, so he, you know how he solved it? Gave it to himself. <laughs> That's how a lot of us think. Philippians 2, verse four, let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Amen. It is so hard for us to break out of the whiffing thinking. Uh, how do we get first in line? How do we move ahead? Uh, do you go to the supermarket and you, you, you are walking towards the checkout line and you say, oh, there's almost nobody there and it's open. And you see someone else pushing their cart in the same direction. They, you can see there, you make eye contact. They got, they're making, they're heading the same line as you and you're far enough apart. You know, Walmart's are huge. You're far enough apart to where I do all my shopping. 
and all of a sudden, you know, I, you pick up the pace, but you don't want to look like you're going real fast. And you're looking casual, and you just all of a sudden you start walking <laughs> real fast like that, and they start pushing their cart real fast, and then you get to that intersection point. And I say, what would Jesus do? He'd walk faster, right? No. <laughs> and then you go like that. That happened to me this week, happened yesterday, I told Karen. And uh, lady was in line ahead of me. And so I stood there, and I had like just two or three things. I didn't have much. And she was having the biggest struggle because it was the self-checkout. There was nobody there. Market was full Friday. But the self-checkout, you know, we, I, I let her go ahead of me. And she so she's having a hard time, and she's trying to find out how to, where's this label on the bananas? Well, there is no label on the bananas. You actually, you know, it's, you got to type in bananas, and it knows what the price is. And, and she, three times, she calls over the attendant who helps you with the self-checkout. You'll know what I'm talking about. They got someone who's sort of on standby there. And I'm waiting, and everyone else in every other line that I thought was too long, they're just going through like you're in a slow motion film, you know, and everything's. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I could stop my feet and just go off to another line. I thought, that won't look very good. So I just wait. And, and eventually she gets through the line, she checks out, and she looks back at me to thank me. First, she says, Thank you for your patience. She goes, You're that pastor. <laughs> and she said, Are you a pastor? I said, Yes. Yeah. She said, I see your programs. I said, Oh, yeah. Said, oh, I love your programs. And, uh, I said, oh boy, I'm glad I didn't stomp off. <laughs> so people are watching all the time. <laughs> Prestige and position, including in line, checking out. So what is the key to success? How do we, it's enough to talk about self-denial, and I haven't covered the gamut of things that are involved. You can fill in your own list of where you struggle with denying yourself. It's all day long, isn't it? We're always thinking about, it's just so natural, it's like the compass points north, we always point towards self. I'll read to you from 1 Corinthians 13. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long, it is kind, it does not envy, it does not parade itself, it is not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, here it is, Love does not seek its own. It's not provoked, it thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love has to be the reason that we deny ourselves. Amen. Otherwise, Wesley said, John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, you know why they're called Methodists? Because they were so methodical about their sanctification and obedience. They had truth statements about every area of life. Your dress, you think Adventists came up with that? No, oh, Methodists had dress, diet, time, work. They just were extremely methodical about their religious worship, their devotions. And Wesley got that from his mother, who was a godly woman. But he came back from doing mission work in North America, and he said, I was lost. And then I learned about righteousness by faith, and I fell in love with Jesus. And he continued to do all of the good deeds, but now he did it for the right reason, because of faith and love. Amen. And so when I talk about self-denial, the Pharisees were the very best at self-denial. I fast twice a week, pay tithe of all that I have. That's important. But are you doing it for the right reason? Otherwise, it's just legalism. But we must learn self-discipline for the right reason. We need to learn to take up our cross and say no to ourselves. And there's a quote I found in the book Acts of the Apostles. This is the one by E.G. White, page 246. Speaking of Paul, who was the hardest working of the apostles, he loved the Lord, he sacrificed. You read about what Paul went through, whipped and shipwrecked and stoned and love for the Lord of glory, whom he had so relentlessly persecuted in the person of his saints, was the actuating principle of his conduct, love the motive power. If ever his ardor in the path of duty flagged, if he ever noticed that he was becoming weak in his duty, one glance at the cross and the amazing love there revealed was enough to cause him to gird up the loins of his mind and to press forward in the path of self-denial. Love, looking at the cross. And it's not just uh, the love, but one more verse on love. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. 
Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Love as Christ loved. He loved us and he gave himself up for us. And remember, now here's the whiff from spiritual principle. If you lose your life, you'll gain it, Jesus said. You take up your cross and you follow him and then you find everything. Love and the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Love for God and the love of God will spread his Spirit in your heart and it's through the Spirit of God you get the power to deny self. Practical tip, don't be overwhelmed with the idea of how many changes you need to make because if you're like me, you're selfish. And the things I didn't learn as a child, I'm wrestling with today. It can be done. Do it in little things, like letting someone go ahead of you at the line or pull in front of you in the street or the potluck line. It'll be interesting to see what happens in just a little while. <laughs> but it's in little things. Practice in little things. Pray for little victories. If you can't fast for a day, fast a meal. But say, Lord, help me learn to deny myself. I want to be ready when I'm going to be really called to forsake everything, maybe be hungry, flee for the hills. I mean, there's going to, it's going to be tough for real Christians in the last days. And I think that so many are going to fail because we're not learning in everyday life to deny ourselves for Christ and for others. Amen? You know, I read about years ago a story of a Chinese Christian. He was actually a, an attendant to a barber in China as a boy. A Christian missionary shared the gospel with this man by the name of Lo Fuk. Lofuk was his name. And uh, he accepted Jesus. Then he said, he asked his master, he said, I cannot work in the barber shop seven days a week. I need to keep the Sabbath. He believed that was Sunday. But he said he would not work on Sunday anymore and he was fired. Well, he managed to survive and ended up becoming a very prosperous businessman in China. And in the 1860s, he was very concerned about what was happening to his countrymen because while the Civil War was going on here in North America, there was another kind of war that was taking place among the Chinese coolies that were being sold and sent to work in the mines in South Africa and South America, building the American railroads in California. And they lived terribly uh, poor lives, grueling conditions, the, the Chinese coolies, and his heart, Lo Fuk's heart went out to them. So you know what he did? He signed up in China, sold himself as a slave to a British company. He went to British Guyana, and he contracted to work as a slave among the coolies for five years so that he could witness to them and experience their conditions so they would listen to him about Jesus. And he did that. And uh, by the age of 43, his lungs gave out and he ended up dying of pulmonary disease directly related with working in the mines. But at that point, he had built two churches and brought 200 of his countrymen to Jesus. And he would work side by side with them. And I thought, wow, talk about denying yourself to say, I am going to give up, forsake everything I have. I'm going to become a slave. I'm going to work in terribly grueling conditions where it stinks and it's miserable and the food is miserable so I can lead other people that are being lost to Christ. You've got to have a passion for souls to do that. That's what self-denial is. I think if the church has a revival of this teaching of self-denial, you will see a revival of mission work, of people being willing to deny themselves and go into difficult circumstances and risk their lives for Jesus. I want to learn it. So you've just listened to me talk to myself. I have a feeling that you maybe feel the same way, that uh, we need to learn how to take up our cross, like Simon took up the cross of Jesus, and follow him and live for him. Is that your desire? Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Watch Amazing Facts television by visiting aftv.org. At AFTV.org, you can view Amazing Facts programming 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Why wait a week? Visit AFTV.org. It's that easy.
Amazing facts change lives. Well, my conversion story is when I was in the Philippines, I just graduated as a nurse. And afterwards, I did not have any religion. And one time, I found myself inside a small church, Catholic church in Manila, and before a big cross. And I was kneeling before, and I could hear Jesus telling me to enter the convent, save myself and also my family. And I said, Lord, I would like to follow you all the way. At that point, I seemed to be happy externally, but because inside the convent, we don't read the Bible, we don't study about the Word of God. We pray the rosaries, we also at the same time study the lives of the saints and also our founders and the encyclicals of the Pope and the Virgin Mary. And so I do not know the truth and I had this torture of conscience, the guilty feelings that cannot be resolved. So I would confess to the priest in the confessional box saying, Father, forgive me. Since my last confession was last week, since then I have committed the following sin, including the root cause. Why am I falling and falling in that same sin over and over again? And still for 21 long years, I struggle and I struggle and I struggle. I realized that I was totally empty I was totally helpless and hopeless and so depressed and so desperate that I would like already to end my life. I was working for five years as Dean of the University of San Agustin College of Nursing in Iloilo City, one of the islands in the Philippines. After five years, I received a commission from my parents to help my sister who is being a battered woman this is one of the reasons why I came over to the United States. It is because my sister needs my help. As I was working in the hospital in New York, my boss, Seraphine, he was so gracious enough to give me an invitation to the Millennium Prophecy. As I was listening to Pastor Doug Bachelor's presentation, my heart really was beating so fast and my mind, I'm able to grasp the truth that this is the truth that I've been longing to hear all my life, that I have been seeking for so long. My personal relationship with Jesus, I can see Jesus as my personal Savior. He is not only the Savior of the whole world, but He is my personal Savior. He was the one who delivered me mightily from the depths of sin from the mighty clay. Pastor Doug Bachelor has been used by the Lord in my conversion. The amazing facts I owe to them. The Lord really blessed this ministry and I'm so proud I was able to attend this millennium prophecy. My life has never been the same. It has given me that peace, that joy that never I have never tasted in my life. And it, I, now I'm set free to be able to work for Him and to follow Him. Christmas Eve, 1971, 17-year-old Julianne Kopka boarded Lanza Flight 508 with her mother in Lima, Peru. They intended to join her father for Christmas at his research station in the Amazon rainforest. After crossing the Andes at about 21,000 feet, their aircraft was enveloped by large dark thunderclouds and it encountered severe turbulence. Lightning was flashing everywhere and the plane was shaken violently, which naturally terrified the passengers. Then, a bolt of lightning struck the plane's engine and tore off a wing. As the doomed airliner hurtled towards the earth, the cabin came apart 
and the next thing she knew, Julianne found herself strapped alone to a row of seats, falling and spinning silently from over 10,000 feet above the rainforest. She plummeted through the jungle canopy and slammed on the forest floor. When she awoke the next day, Julianne was amazed to realize she had survived the two-mile fall with just a broken collarbone and a bad gash in her arm. After failing to find any other survivors, Julianne relied on what her father had taught her, that walking downstream will always lead to civilization. So, with a bag of candy that had fallen from the plane and one sandal, she started walking. For 10 days, Julianne hobbled, swam, or floated downstream. Her wounds became infected and she was plagued by maggots while having to dodge crocodiles, piranhas, and relentless insects. Eventually, she came to a shack where she slept and she was soon discovered by Peruvian loggers. Eventually, Julianne was united with her amazed father. It's hard to imagine a 17-year-old girl surviving such a fall and then hiking alone out of the world's largest rainforest. You know, the Bible talks about some who survived an even greater fall than Julianne. In fact, according to the scriptures, when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, it brought the whole human race down. But Jesus came to redeem the world from sin. Perhaps you're thinking to yourself, well, that's okay for the world, but I've fallen too far. Well, if the Lord could save Julianne, God can save you. You've not gone farther than Moses, who is guilty of murder, or David, who is guilty of adultery, or Peter, who denied Jesus, and all of them were saved and restored from their fall. Or maybe you're thinking, I've fallen too many times. Be of good courage. It says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. And Jesus cast seven devils out of Mary Magdalene. So don't get discouraged, friend. If you've fallen, get back up again. The same way that he could save Julianne, lead her from that lost condition in the rainforest and restore her to her father, Jesus can lead you from your lost condition and restore you to your heavenly father. For life-changing Christian resources, visit afbookstore.com or call 1-800-538-7275.